Hello. Hello, the peoples. Oh, the peoples. How are you doing? Tell us. Tell us everything. I can't hear you. Speak up. Speak up a bit if you can. Mm. No, they're quiet. They're a quiet bunch. They're, they're shy. They're peaceful. They're probably enlightened. Maybe they're enlightened. Maybe they're shy. They're all enlightened. You have your views. I have shy mine. enlightenment. Shyness and enlightenment. <laughs> Same. Here they are. Hello. Hello the Denise lovelies. and Melanie and Paula. Hi, Paula. Hi, Mom. Karen. And that's it. Just five people. Anne Marie. <laughs> Alexa. Monica. Hello. Cindy from Dallas. All the peoples from all over the world. How's everyone's week been? Yeah. Welcome to 2020, y'all. Yeah, it's on. It's happening. Can you even imagine? It's 2020. It's 2020. That's and like way beyond like 2001, a space odyssey was supposed to. We're all walking in space by then. Yeah. It's 2020. I haven't. I fell out a window once, but I've never walked in space. <laughs> and a big love to all my Aussies. Yeah, I have something to say about that. Do you? Yeah, I do, but I'm waiting for more peeps to come on. So I think we might as well begin. For those watching in a different time, Australia is currently on fire. And yeah. It's not. Good. If this is coming to you at some time in the future, Let's we hope are, they put it out. Yeah, let's hope that if this is months from the time we're recording it, that Australia is no longer on fire. Yeah. Um, and it's no laughing matter, guys. We know that. Um, so many people struggling so hard. I mean, just in the heat, let alone before the fires even just started. The air quality. The air quality and the heat is horrific. And then half a billion animals have died at least. And that's not counting reptiles or frogs. Let alone yeah. insects. Hmm. Um, hmm. Yeah, it's uh, wah, 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 yeah, big it's downer. Big but today I was reading this gorgeous book, which I was given for Christmas, One Long River of Song by Brian Doyle. Woo! Um, he's an essayist and a gorgeous essayist, and he writes this, this um, essay about 9-11 and the people who died in 9-11 and how they reached out to each other. Um, and people would join hands and jump from the towers. And he talks about how that's the most eloquent prayer. And he says, it's what, gives, it's what makes me believe that we are not craven fools and charlatans to believe in God, to believe that human beings have greatness and holiness within them, like seeds that open only under great fires. And I read that and I thought maybe the holiness and the greatness within us is bursting open like seeds under great fires. And that after going through this horror, um, the people and animals of Australia will be okay somehow because of that greatness and holiness. And that I don't believe this is the last environmental catastrophe we're going to see. And if we have enough greatness and holiness within us, to turn things around. That is kind of the theme of my entire life. Since I was tiny, I was like obsessed with, they say, my family told me that by the time I was two, I'd memorized like 700 and something mammals in this encyclopedia of mammals. And you um, believe it, right? It's I'm, I was super obsessed from the time I was little with ecology and with animals and with nature. And I would go absolutely mentally insane as a child when I'd hear about habitat destruction and it wasn't even it wasn't even a gleam in the eye of what's happening now and still when i was 40 ish i decided or i didn't decide i had this feeling open up within my heart while i was in africa one day tracking rhinoceros that said oh the whole reason i i'm here at this point is that this is going to be, we're going to have an adventure as humans. We are going to come very close to destroying ourselves. And if anything's going to turn that around, it's going to be us. So I think I came here for that adventure. And I think a lot of us maybe came for that adventure. And it's going to, I'm going to push it. Everybody says in, in their spirits, they said, I'm, I want to go down at a time when we're going to push it right to its very limits. Take it to the limit. See what we can happen. Yeah. So... 
everything is temporary and the circle of life goes on. But wow, what an, an interesting time to be alive, right? You can be horrified and horrified and horrified. And then at some point you just go, wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Holy smokes, quite literally. Literally. Is this my cue? This is your cue, yeah. Um, speaking of all the the beautiful creatures and beautiful things that are all doomed to, to disappear into entropy at some point. Another book I've been reading this week, and I love this book. Yeah. It's um a lay person's account of different theories of quantum physics. It's phenomenal, something deeply hidden by Sean Carroll. Really one of the best, most accessible books on quantum mechanics you will ever ever read in your life. And since maybe some of you don't have time to read it, I will tell you the takeaway from my point of view. So you may have heard of something called the Copenhagen, Copen, Copenhagen or something, you Danes can tell me how to say it. Um, Interpretation of quantum, of what happens when they do experiments on subatomic particles. What happens is that these subatomic particles, say electrons, they act like waves of energy until we measure them. And when we measure them, the wave potentials all collapse and they become particle-like. So things that the Copenhagen inter uh, interpretation is that everything is wave energy until it is observed by consciousness. And observation by consciousness turns energy into matter. Mm. Okay, but that actually, the only reason they said that is because we don't feel like everything is waves of energy. We feel like things are solid. So they said, well, things become solid at some point. Little things, electrons, are not solid until we look at them, but other things are solid. But there's no like physics reason that that should be true. In fact, if you want to look at what the experiments really say, they say that everything made of subatomic particles is just wave energy. So that means the electron, the machine that measures it, the people doing the measurements, we're all just waves of energy. In fact, we're all entangled waves of energy since waves of energy interact with each other, we're all entangled with everything in the universe. And everything in the universe is just a wave function of which we are a part. And here's the interesting difference. The way we perceive the epistemological version of reality, which it talks about the way we think, the way we see, has to do with matter. But the ontological reality, that which is, the way things really exist, is all just energy just waves of energy. There's nothing else at all. So if you read this, and he gives a few other, that's that's the many worlds, that's the, the core of the many worlds hypothesis of quantum mechanics. Um, Sean Carroll describes a couple more that are fascinating as well. But this is the most, actually it's kind of risen up and, and most physicists now go with this many worlds hypothesis, which says that we are just waves of energy. That's all we are. That's all anything is. And it's all tangled up in one universal wave function. So you have, here's the thing. You read this stuff late at night, you have very interesting dreams. At least I do. I have dreams where everything is just waves in water. And every now and then whales go by and they represent consciousness. And I'm like watching this in my dreams. And even when I'm awake, I look at objects and I think, if you really follow through the logic of quantum mechanics, that only exists as I think it exists. The reality of it and the reality of me is wave functions. And that's all there really is. Well, here's the interesting thing. If you take the, the many worlds version of quantum mechanics, there's no need to put consciousness in as creator of anything. But it leaves as a question, what the heck is consciousness? And most of these guys think that consciousness just arises out of a chance um, mix of neurons in the, in, in the human brain. I don't think that accounts for a lot of the experience of what actually seems to happen in reality. But really, it doesn't prove anything about consciousness. So if there's consciousness in me, if there's consciousness in you, and where everything we see and everything we are is one big wave function, then consciousness may pervade everything. 
And this squares with my experience of doing the dishes as a child. <laughs> when I would wash the silverware, and as I put the silverware from the soapy water into the hot water, it would have conversations with me in my mind because I was a kid. And we, little kids kind of infuse everything with personality, right? Everything with consciousness. And I would think, oh, I'm going to, now I'm going to wash you and put you with your friends and the knives and the forks. I would imagine them being sad when they were separated and happy when I put them together again. And um, later in my life, I was doing research on shamanic traditions and I was interviewing um, an anthropologist who'd spent a lot of time with the Siberian shamans, which are, who are the oldest tradition of, of shamanism still existing. And I was, I wanted to talk to her about her research, but instead she just wanted to um, talk to me about communicating with her husband who had passed away. And as a means of sort of passing the time, she taught me how to bend the silverware on the restaurant table using mainly my mind. I realize this gathering room is going in unusual directions, but a lot of you have come to things where I've spoken in person and you've given me spoons and you've seen how a spoon that cannot be bent at some points can be bent. In fact, it becomes very easy to bend if you go into certain states of consciousness. And this comes all the way back to what I believed when I was a little kid, playfully believed, I didn't really believe it, that if you're holding a piece of silverware and you allow yourself to go into a conscious state that is connected with the universe, conscious of its connection with the universe, which is love, you can in fact seem to feel consciousness inside that piece of silverware. It's not like a human consciousness, but it's like, hello. And certain pieces of silverware, if you ask them to bend, they will say yes. And at the moment they say, yes, a very rigid piece of metal that you couldn't bend suddenly bends like soft clay. I could do it. I thought of doing it like on screen, but how would you know I was using a really strong spoon? I could totally fake that experiment. And I think a lot of people do. But try it yourself and you will see that it's very hard to explain why you're just holding a spoon and you can't bend it. And then you go into a state of love and you feel for the spoon's consciousness and you it talks to you and says it will bend and then it bends. I taught a man to do this once um, and he'd been diagnosed with an awful disease and um, I showed him how, he said, I, I wish I could just see one thing that I couldn't explain in the world. I really don't think there is anything other than what we see, you know, matter, we die, the end. So I, I showed him how to bend a spoon and then he took the spoon and he was trying to bend it and it didn't work. And then he, he and his wife were sitting together and he leaned back into her embrace and she put her arms around him and suddenly the spoon went Voop. And he was like, oh my God, oh my God. And he was really focused on this spoon. Now some other people who were with us said, there's a professor there who said, that's just a party trick, who cares? The point is not that we can bend spoons with our minds, the point is that sometimes we can bend them and sometimes we can't, depending on our state of consciousness. And that's what the first man understood when he felt it happen. So after reading quantum physics all week, I've been walking around feeling the consciousness of other objects, you know, animals, trees, and then also things like a glass of water, the consciousness of water. I mean, water is in all living things. Water must be in incredibly important carrier of consciousness, maybe, I don't know. If you have read Mariko Kondo's book, The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up, which was a massive bestseller a couple of years ago, you will have read a Japanese sort of um, modern day Shinto version of the same thing I've been talking about all this time. In Shinto, which is the ancient Japanese religion, every object was imbued with a spirit and you had to communicate with the spirits of things to get things to work harmoniously. So Marie Kondo goes into people's houses and she's a tidiness expert. And the first thing she does is get down on her knees and thank the space for allowing her in and ask it what it wants to become. And then she asks everything from a sock to like, a plant, well, plants are alive, but from a sock to a picture on the wall, what does it want? 
what, will it cooperate? Does it want to live in the space it's in? Could it be better taken care of somewhere else? Does it need to be gone? And what she believes is that if an object and you have joy in each other's company, you belong together. And in that spark of joy, she's very particular about it, it must spark joy. In that spark of joy, there's a communication between two versions of the intelligence of the universe. And this is only in the end of her book, but I really think it's why it became a bestseller because something in us likes, even though it's not our culture at all, something in us resonates to that Shinto version of everything having a spirit and everything wanting to connect in certain ways and everything wanting us to communicate with it. So before we go to questions, I just, I, you know, I was thinking practice of the week. Here's spiritual practice of the week. Try this, I'm gonna try it this week and I'd love it if you guys would too. Go into a space that you love, maybe your bedroom or your study or any, any little place that you feel comfortable in. Go in and talk to the space as if it's conscious. Go in assuming in brackets, you don't have to act crazy around other people. Go into a room or a space in your house assuming that it has a consciousness. Thank it for interacting with you in this apparent version of the universe and ask how it would like to be arranged. Ask what objects it would like to have in it. And then ask various objects, like for example, if, if, your, if your little study says that it wants to have a plant in it, go to a plant nursery or a grocery store and then talk to each of the plants laid out before you and say, which of you wants to go in my study? And then, take it to put in the study. So I've been doing this with um, little bits of my house and I'm gonna do it for a whole room this week. But the most interesting things start to happen, you guys, when we start to acknowledge the consciousness in all things and allow it to speak to us. So some enlightened people, Nisargadatta Maharaj, my favorite enlightened dude, he said, when I look within me and see that I am nothing, that is wisdom. When I look around me and see that I am everything, that is love. Between these two, my life turns. You can do that in a room. You look inside you and realize there's nothing there but a wave interacting with all other waves. There's nothing. And then you look around and you realize you're connected to everything. And that you get wisdom and love in the interaction between you and every single other thing on this planet. That's what I have to say about that. So if anybody has questions, I'm going to ask the, uh, the notorious Badger to indulge us with her uh, august presence. Hello, Badger. My august presence or my august presence? That only makes sense if you have an Aussie accent. <laughs> aghast. We say aghast. Aghast. You're august. But when you're aghast, you're aghast. It's the same for Australians. They can be a ghast and a goss. Uh, I don't even know. <laughs> oh, ask me a question. I shall ask you many because the peeps, they, they have questions today. Let me tell you. It is weird. Truth, reality, physics. Yeah. Um, Pamela asks, would this work on my spine? It should, right? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, one of the things I'd really love you to do. Oh, I'm so glad you asked. Because I've been working out every day. Oh, I'm enjoying it so much. Well, one day this week I had a really bad pain in my foot. So what I did was I got into a hot bath and then I just spent time sending love to my foot and letting my foot talk to me about what it wanted. And I felt this really sweet sensation and I thought, even if you're deathly ill or you have a, an awful condition where you can't get up, even if you can't move at all, quadriplegic, whatever, a daily workout could be simply sending love to various aspects of your body and listening to see what you can do for them that would be loving to them. I love that. That's what so a wonderful good. question. Um, some people are asking if they can't bend the spoon yet, what are they missing? Well, you may have too big a spoon. <laughs> I, I got to the point where I could bend rebar. I could bend, I once bent a car bumper back into shape, but you have to practice. Yeah. Deepak Chopra told me he knows people who can do it from across the room with just their minds. And then he said, but they never do anything else. <laughs> so 
Yes, you could be getting it using too thick a spoon too early. Um, when you start to get the feeling, I've seen people can bend like monkey wrenches, tempered steel, thick, really rigid steel. But um, it's weird. You have to get the feel of it, like riding a bicycle, and then you can sort of push it further and further. So I've got really big soup ladles and things. And sometimes you have to sit with it for quite a while, feeling it. Like I probably had sat for an hour before I first did it with my spoon. Yeah, the, um, the writer Michael Crichton, who not only wrote Jurassic Park and the and Andromeda Strain and ER, but he was also, uh, he went to hard medical school. He was six foot nine. He was an unusual human being. And he wrote in his memoirs that he went to spoon bending parties in Beverly Hills where they would have this basket of spoons and he would, the instructions where you reach in and you ask each spoon, you touch it and say, do you want to play with me? Do you want to play with me? And supposedly certain spoons are more interested in certain humans. So then he'd get a spoon and he could, he said he had, his spoon got so malleable that he could like play with the bowl of the spoon and make different shapes out of it and stretch wow. it and stuff. Yeah. He was also psychic. He was picked out of, with several other psychics to go on a shipwreck finding expedition in the Caribbean where they found 18 wrecks in like four months, some of which were buried up to 200 feet under the sand at the bottom of the ocean. I yeah. love the things you know about Michael Crichton. <laughs> I know. Um, I found that out secretly too. <laughs> but it's true. <laughs> I found it out from a spoon. No. <laughs> now I speak. What? What? Oh, I'm receiving messages from an invisible spoon. Um, Sandy says, what if you have a space that brings on such negativity that you can't bear being in there to condo it? Um, you might want to ask it what's wrong with it. And if, there, if there's anything you can do to help. Uh, you might want to just stay away from it, if possible. Places have extremely, I mean, there's something also about time not being linear. How, as Einstein said, the difference between the past, the present, and the future is nothing but a stubbornly persistent illusion. Because when you go into a place where something's happened, I think sometimes every, the time collapse is, uh, is available to a part of our consciousness and we can feel things that have happened there. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I remember going on the grounds of Harvard the first time and just like going, Oh. Centuries of nerds. <laughs> Centuries of nerds. Now I could literally feel the the voltage of the minds mm -hmm. that yeah, had yeah. been there, and that, going back in time and forward in time, and it was, and you can feel the same thing, like, like when I was in Cambodia, yeah, yeah. where the and and Rwanda. So you can feel things one way or the other. But one thing I found in Rwanda where the space made me really freaked out, I got to tell you, the entire country felt really scary to me. Love to all the Rwandan viewers. But um, what happened was I had to open to, I did talk to the space. I was there with some people who were really, they, they were desperate to make peace with it somehow. So we ended up talking to it. And what I felt there was that nowhere else that I'd ever been had so many souls called out so hard for compassion and enlightenment and love and forgiveness and all the things that went along with the atrocities. No one else had ever called so hard. And as a result, it felt like there was this enormous amount of light flowing in to that very spot where so much darkness had, had reigned for a while. So it was, it was weird. It was one of the most magical places I've ever been. At first it was terrifying. I wanted to get right back in the plane and leave. And then I sort of broke through this wall and it was just like a wash in beauty and, and love in some heart sense that I can't really describe. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. Well, a lot of, yeah, a lot of people are asking different questions about that state of love. Mm. And consciousness um, and Mary asks is it the same as the way you feel in meditation one feels depends I mean I've felt every which way in meditation mm. but um, most important thing is it's not manic it's extremely quiet and still and peaceful and to the mind it looks like absolutely nothing it's just blah there's no language going on there's no cognitive meaning there's only peace. And at first that, that becomes boring to the mind. 
And this is why people sometimes will get in a relationship and it's very intense and sexual and everything. And then it calms down <clears throat> and they think, oh, the magic is gone and they move on to another partner. If you stay with peace long enough to stop wanting the highs and lows of, of manic, depressive sort of human moods, what happens is that peace opens up like a flower and it starts to blossom into these levels and levels and levels of love. It becomes infinitely deep. And if that's what you mean by how you feel in meditation, then absolutely. But it's also how you feel. Like I remember when I got my kids a beagle puppy when they were school age and they all went to school and the beagle and I were home together. And this little puppy looked at me and I never really bonded with a dog before. He looked at me and I looked at him and something passed between us and he was forever my dog and I was forever his only human. And that also, it's as silly as it seemed, that opened up and opened up and opened up infinitely. So any form of love, any form of love from sitting quietly to getting a puppy to a romantic relationship is, an, is a port portal into that kind of connection yeah. that's so cool yeah. um donna says how can we not only give love but absorb love from the energy of things around us it's the same thing isn't it? yeah but it requires the the most important thing and the thing that studies show is one of the most important components of happiness is the expression of gratitude so not just the feeling of gratitude but the expression of gratitude and that's another thing Marie Kondo does so beautifully is to thank her things for what they do for her and to express thanks. Try this just with the people in your life. Try expressing all the thanks you feel, even if it's small. And, and it puts you in a mindset where you're completely open to love and where other things are sort of drawn to love you. Gratitude is intense magic it is like a superpower it's money in the bank if we knew what gratitude really can do for us we would be so grateful and the more i try to express gratitude the more grateful i feel and the more wonderful things happen yeah yeah my kid like you i'm so grateful for every one of you really truly Me truly too. Me too. so there's a few people who've asked in different ways just about how to sustain that that feeling, how to sustain that mode as they go through their lives or in conflict or in different situations? Well, we have this incredible ally, this friend who will never ever desert us to the moment we breathe our last. And a beagle. <laughs> yes, it is a beagle. No, it, its name is suffering. Mm. And it's there the way our brainstem is there to remind us to breathe if we stop breathing it's there to say when we've slipped away from the consciousness of love and it at first is uncomfortable and then it becomes problematic and then it becomes unbearable because it wants us to return home and the only thing strong enough to make us remember to return home is suffering so that's why i think we were given it as a gift and every time we slip off the course we've chosen, you know, that's best for our hearts. Ro had a shoulder doctor who said, here's how your life will go because you have shoulder hypermobility. You will do your exercises. You will feel good. You will stop doing your exercises. You will feel bad. You will remember to do your exercises. You will feel good. This guy is one of the, he's like the best shoulder expert in the business. And he was like, don't even pretend it's going to go any other way than this. This is the rest of your life. And it's the same for us. We slip out of, uh, you know, Brian Doyle's uh, talking about the greatness and holiness within us. We slip out of it. We suffer. Maybe a little. Maybe we don't notice that it gets worse. Then we remember, ah, return. Return to gratitude. Return to love return to vulnerability, return to wanting the connection, wanting the safety, wanting the comfort of knowing everything is conscious and everything loves us, and then return to the loving of things and then return to the receiving, which returns you to the knowing that you are nothing and you are everything and your life turns between wisdom and love in that infinity sign, always. 
So thank you, thank you, thank you for gathering here with us. Welcome we are back, all ladies and gentlemen. one wave function. We're all the same being. We're all conscious. We're all talking to each other all the time. If you doubt me, ask Sean Carroll, the physicist. He will <laughs> deny it. <laughs> we love you. Right, we'll see you next, you, week. Bye. see you next week. Bye.